Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you guys today. I feel like I am standing in a room with giants. All right, um, let me go ahead and get started. I'm talking a little bit about the Ladies' Day riot of 1897 today, uh, but more about the feminist use of baseball spaces um, that, that women have used over, over time. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, as, most interested, as most interested in baseball history know, to call baseball's origin story murky would be an understatement. In, 1903, in 1903, Henry Chadwick, the English American sports writer, baseball st statistician and historian, wrote that in his opinion, baseball was a descendant of the English children's game Rounders, which he had played during his childhood. Rounders was a well-known game that was played by both boys and girls and had been popular for decades. That history was challenged by Spalding, Albert Goodwill Spalding. The two disagreed so thoroughly on the, on the identity of the inventor and the history of the game that in 1907, Spalding appointed the Mills Commission to research and uncover the true history of the game. This commission ultimately anointed uh, Civil War Abner, or General Abner Doubleday as the inventor, which Spalding canonized in his book, America's National Game, a few years later. In this book, Spalding pronounces that baseball is war. How do I change? Here we go. I'm sorry. There we go. A few In this book, Spalding pronounces that baseball is war. The founder of our national game became a major general in the United States Army, and later he said baseball is a man-maker. Spalding's insistence that baseball was a masculine endeavor made Doubleday the perfect hero figure for Spalding's baseball myth. He wanted baseball with a capital B to be understood as an American born game, a descendant of the American game town ball, not the English rounders, played by American boys and men spread by soldiers to towns all over the place during the Civil War. Spalding did not want anything about baseball to be understood as feminine or foreign, and this is where we can pinpoint the beginning of separation of women and femininity from the game. The annexation of baseball to American manhood was the result of explicit efforts to banish girls and women from the field, presumably giving the game directly to white middle-class American men. At the turn of the 20th century, there were suggestions that the non-contact game was a little too soft or too feminine, so players and fans alike doubled down on reinforcing its inherent masculinity. The separation of baseball from all things feminine or female was accomplished in two ways. First, by rewriting baseball history to depict it as a masculine sport, and secondly, by the invention and use of softball as a feminine substitute for baseball. Um, as a note, softball was invented in 1887 by men as a wintertime indoor baseball alternative, and it became to be seen as the safer, more modest game, more suitable, that is, for women, but that's another paper completely. Regardless of how and when baseball came to America, women have been playing the game since time immemorial. Uh, this was Victorian America when women were strictly discouraging from participating in the public sphere. Um, public spheres where women could freely exist outside of the home or church, baseball fields became a space where women could interact and socialize each, with each other outside of the watchful eyes of their husbands, parents, or churches. And so they immediately became early sites for progressive women's work in the US. Before Spalding got involved, of course, women were publicly played from open air games for hygiene to exhibitions like this poster advertised. And Perry, I saw you had this behind you. <laughs> um, this is from 1879. This was uh, Manchester ball ground, uh, ball grounds in New York. Um, and this is the, the writing here is the, I, I, so that you can read what it says on the actual um, poster. He writes that um, Herodotus attributes the invention of the ball to the Lydians. Succeeding writers have affirmed that fe a female of distinction named, I'm gonna murder this, Angala, of, a native of Corsera, was the first who made the ball for the purpose of pastime, which she presented to Nausicaa, the daughter of King of Phoenicia, and the same time he taught her how to use it. This piece of history is, uh, is partly derived from Homer, who introduced this to the prince of Cor Corsaira with her maidens amusing themselves with handball. And this is the actual, um, right here, this is the quote from Homer, where he, re where he says, o'er the green meat and the sporting virgins play, their shining veils unbound along the skies, tossed and retossed the ball incessant flies. So this idea is from the eighth century. Girls have been playing games of ball since at least the eighth century. And Homer himself gives girls, um, a, a woman, uh, credit for inventing it. 
unknowingly, um, the, the book that he was talking about was The Sports and Pastimes of the People of England by Joseph Strutt from, in, from 1802. And unknowingly agreeing with Chadwick in the future, Strutt's book also claimed that baseball-like games could be traced back to the 14th century, more specifically girls, uh, games like Stool's Ball and the girls' game, Rounders. Spalding doubled down on the manly myth saying, but neither our wives or sisters, our daughters, nor our sweethearts may play baseball on the field. They may play other games, but baseball is too strenuous for womankind, except to say that she may take part in the grandstand with applause for the brilliant play, with waving kerchief to the hero of the three bagger. And since she is ever a loyal partisan of the home time, the, with smiles of derision and for the umpire when he gives us the worst of it. And for the same reason with occasional perfectly decorous demonstrations when it becomes necessary to rattle the opposing pitcher. And so it went. Despite gender, uh, strict gender roles, women have been making themselves at home in the ballpark since the earliest organized matches. In those earliest days, women were invited to the games as spectators to subdue the immoral behavior of the male fans, which led to promotions like Ladies' Day being offered from the very beginning. Women have been invested in baseball as fans, spectators, strategists, and participants since the earliest days of the game, but cultural norms from the Victorian era, when baseball became popularized, considered the behavior of male fans during organized matches too rough for polite ladies to attend, and their playing was just out of the question. In an effort to make their male fans behave more civilly during the games, teams began to encourage women's attendance through Ladies' Day's promotions. It is unclear who originally came up with the idea of Ladies' Day, though some give credit to the New Orleans uh, player, owner, manager, Ch uh, Charles Abner Powell, he's pictured there, um, a player manager that implemented the idea to increase revenue for a struggling team in the 1880s. Other sources suggest that the practice of admitting women at no charge started much earlier, almost as soon as admission fees began being collected at the game. Um, the Brooklyn Eagle, for example, reported in 1865, hereafter ladies will be admitted free of charge to all matches on the Capitoline grounds. No tickets of admission will be required. There are countless other examples of women being admitted free to ball games before Paul, uh, Powell's New Orleans campaign, uh, but any truth to that specific moniker, Ladies Day had origins uh, before Powell are murky. The, admit, the, the custom of free admission for women was not just an instance of team park owners being generous, uh, but part of the culture idea that the presence of women increased both the number of male ticket buyers and the level of good behavior of those men. As Chadwick wrote, experience has shown that nothing tends to elevate the game, to rid it of evil influences, to lead it to proper decorum and to gentlemanly con contests than the countenance and patronage of the ladies. Ladies' days were usually held on weekdays to, boo mid, to boost midweek attendance, and women were admitted free with a ticket-buying male escort. The practice quickly spread, and in 1891, uh, watch, the Washington Sunday Herald declared, it is now fashionable for ladies to make up a party and go without a usual male escort to a baseball game. The teams did not profit much from these promotions, and, but the events were useful in, a numerous, in numerous ways. Even though cultural expectations were high, women were, of course, not always perfectly behaved at the ballpark. A notorious example of this imperfect behavior, nicknamed the Ladies' Day Riot of 1897, occurred in September 1897 at a game between the home team, the Washington Nationals, and the visitors, the Cincinnati Red Stockings. This story highlights the way that historical memory of baseball has been unfairly gendered male, as well as the sexist roots of baseball commemoration. There's two versions of this story that are articulated, one that has shown up in multiple baseball histories, including on the Sabre website, um, which I found this week, and one lonely reference to an actual uh, newspaper. What everyone agrees on are the basics of the riot, that Wynn Mercer was an exceptionally handsome, popular pitcher for the home team, the Washington, the Washington Nationals, and that he was ejected in either the third or the fifth inning by the umpire for arguing balls and strikes. This is where the agreement on what happened with the day ends. In the more popular version of the story, the game took place on Ladies' Day, and the women in the stands were so incensed that their pitcher was tossed out from the game because uh, apparently he gave the umpire a pair of spectacles. That was the joke. Um, they were so upset that the women, uh, that their favorite pitcher was tossed out of the game, that they charged the field, they knocked out the umpire, Bill Carpenter, to the ground, they beat him up, they kicked him, and they tore his uniform. The women not involved in the action in the field with the umpire were reportedly tearing out the seats in the stands and breaking the windows before the police got the commotion under control. 
This is the version of the story that appears in many baseball history books that mention the event, giving men historical evidence that women are too emotional and too rancorous or even hysterical to be granted entrance to such a gentlemanly game and that they are only there to look at the athlete's physique and not enjoy the game. A second version of the story uncovered online by sports writer Darlene Langley, details are based on the actual newspaper report uh, printed in 1897. Um, in her essay for District on Death, she wrote that it was the detail about the breaking windows that not, did not quite make sense for her, which led her to tracking down the actual details of the story. Um, she said that most baseball stadiums of the era, the picture here is the, the stadium where this game supposedly took place. Um, she said the most baseball stadiums of the era didn't tend to fit, feature too many windows, especially near the grandstands and the cheap seats. Boundary Park, where the Senators played in 1897, had a distinct lack of windows. Re researching the game in the newspapers of the time, she found that on Tuesday, September 4th, 1897, page six of the Washington Times reported that women assail the umpire with the following text. The male portion of the spectators might have felt like mobbing Carpenter, but they refrained from becoming violent. Not so, however, with woman. Crowding around the place where the umpire comes into the grandstand, they awaited him with drawn parasols and upright fans. Just what language would, uh, like, what just the language was like would rather be hard to translate, but no further had Carpenter started for the office than he was assailed with whatever women had in their hands. One used her fist and one was not slow in telling her companions that she had come near to hitting him in a solar plexus. The umpire was too manly to turn upon the women and made rapid strides for the office. That was the whole riot. In the write-up to the game and all the other local papers at the time, um, there is no mention of the riot made at all. According to the Times, Mercer was tossed in the third inning by the umpire, not the fifth. Mercer was being abusive to the umpire and was sent to the bench. Um, the Washington Times recapped the incident where Carpenter changed the call on a play after deliberating with coaches and umpires, and the fans felt that it unfairly turned the tide of the game to the Cincinnati Red Stockings, who eventually won the game. It was the blown call that had upset the women fans and led to the after-game confrontation with Carpenter described above. Instead, the women's uh, fans rioting over their favorite loop being <clears throat> their favorite looking player being ejected. The women were upset by a particularly bad call on the field, which led to the home team losing the game. And that was the extent of the so-called Ladies' Day riot of 1897. There was no destruction of property, no broken windows, and the police did not have to be called in to restore order. The women did not rip off the unfire's clothes, tear out chairs, break windows, nor did they rush the field. They waited patiently for him after the game, and they whacked him with their parasols um, as he was trying to sneak out of the stadium and disguise himself uh, as a fan. He did not need to be rescued from the attacking women, and he ran away from them to the safety of his office quickly, according to the Times report. The more popular version of the angry lovesick women rioting onto the field is full of sexist connotation, and it fortifies the oft-repeated and currently held idea that women are only in the stadium to ogle the athletes, not enjoy the game they play. It's a theme that we see repeated throughout American sports history, especially contemporary attitudes on female spectatorship. The documented, the documented real story is e easier to believe for actual fans, but the mythologized lovesick version seems to be easier to believe for the wider, mostly male, nostalgic, nostalgic audience for baseball history. Acknowledged or not, women have long cared about the actual game and the results of gameplay. The original newspaper write-up of the event makes it easy to understand why fans of any gender were angry. The ump made a lousy call that cost the team, the home team the game. Like many fans of female fans of baseball today, the women in attendance that fateful day were passionate about the game and they cared about the outcome. They were not just oblivious hormone women, hormone driven women who only took interest in the appearance of the players. <clears throat> in 1909, as a direct response to the men's growing frustration with women enjoying the parks um, in male dominated spaces, the National League banned Ladies Day promotions in all major leagues parks, asserting that women no longer required a special day or free admission to attend the games as they had become full-fledged fans. Many of the owners likely feared they would lose sales for, to the paying male fans who had voiced their displeasure with the Ladies' Days. Though the less established American League continued to profit and continued to hold the Ladies' Days, this ban drove away unknown number of female fans who no longer felt welcome or wanted at the park. <clears throat> On the other hand, the game of baseball was not always the main concern for women at the parks. Um, the idea of women in baseball became entrenched in popular culture. For example, Take Me Out to the Ball Game is the third most song, sung song in the United States, just behind, 
just behind the Star Spangled Banner and Happy Birthday. It's a seventh inning stretch standard. Most every American has heard the chorus about buying peanuts and Cracker Jacks, but very few know that there are two verses along to the song as well. It was written and published by Jack Norwith in 1908, and the song has two verses and a chorus. Uh, the mostly unknown first verse about baseball mad Katie Casey um, she is the loving protagonist of the story, and she is being asked out on a date by her boyfriend. She declines the offer of going to a movie and makes the unusual request that he instead take her out to, a see, a, to see a game, putting her, a girl, into a very masculine space. I put the first verse here. Um, Katie Casey was baseball mad. She had the fever and had it bad. Uh, just a root for the hometown crew, every sow Katie Blue. On a Saturday night, her young beau called to see if she'd like to go to see a show, but Miss Katie said, no, I'll tell you what you can do. You can take me out to the ball game, right? So Katie Casey was most likely inspired by real life baseball fame, fa fan and famous vaudeville actress, Trixie Fraganza, uh, Northwood's girlfriend at the time. Her photo appeared on the cover of the wildly popular sheet music for the original song. Um, she was an influential and prominent uh, suffragist who advocated for women's social and political equality. Um, during the 1900s. She was a dynamic present in the presence in the movement that needed to draw young, energetic women into the calls. She attended rallies in support of women's rights to vote and once said, I do not believe that any man, at least no man I know, is better fitted to form a political opinion than I am. Norworth, uh, the writer of the song, released a second version of the song uh, with a different character in 1927. Um, the second version is much more specific and forward, and its placement of a female fan um, was likely written about Northwood's second wife, uh, his Zigfield Follies co-star, Nora Bays. Um, instead of a feminist anthem and Katie Casey being baseball mad, the second version is about a woman operating, um, about going to a game with her boyfriend. <clears throat> Katie Casey was knowledgeable about the sport. She was argumentative with the umpire. She was standing, not sitting in the front row. She was a new woman of the early 20th century, empowered, engaged, and living in the world, un un uninhibited and full of passion. <clears throat> Freedom to socialize at games uh, afforded women uh, the opportunity to gather and organize around social issues. In May 1915, for example, the National Women's Suffrage Movement marched into the polo grounds ballpark of the New York Giants. The Giants were persuaded to hold the first of several National Women's Suffrage Day, where teams of nine women would work together to sell tickets on commission, um, and the other women would purchase and tickets and attend the games. Um, they would give uh, suffrage literature and souvenirs um, to everyone that came. From 1915 to 1919, um, so-called suffrage games were played all over the country, um, which were important because women were able to use their creativity to strategically make use of sports to promote the cause of suffrage. They were able to bring the concept of women's suffrage to the mainstream, bringing their cause directly to the men that they needed to vote for it. Additionally, they were able to show just how popular their cause truly was by the sheer magnitude of the suffrage games and what it took for them to succeed. The women had a plan and it was working. <clears throat> As the vi visibility of female baseball spect spectators increased, a male backlash took place. Attacks on female baseball fans became commonplace, and over time, incidents increased in both number and ferocity. The complaints and disparaging efforts of men were many. Men utilized numerous publications to craft an image of female fans as both dangerous and insincere, suggesting that they were, had questionable morals for even attending the games, though they did not mention the questionability of their own morals for attending. The men complained that not only did the women fans obtain nothing from their visits to the park, but they also ruined the experience for serious male fans in attendance. In 1909, as a direct response to the men's growing frustrations with women enjoying the games in the male-dominated spaces, once again, the National League banned Ladies' Day's promotion. In the early, this would go back and forth um, for decades. And in the 1970s, a New York man sued arguing that discounted tickets on Ladies' Day was reverse discrimination uh, because it economically favored women. In 1973, the, the New York Human Rights Commission ruled in his favor and ended free and discounted ticket sales for women at New York baseball stadiums for good. The lawsuits were successful and ladies' days were no more. 
Women's reactions were mixed. Some feminists at the time agreed because baseball teams were frequently demeaning their fans with promotions such as Hot Pants Night. Um, both the Washington Senators and the Kansas City Royals were guilty of this particularly gross um, promotion. Um, the women of the 70s continued to press for equality, emboldened by those desperate attempts to curb their increasing power, and the women's liberation movement was born around this time. Um, the dissolution of Dave, Ladies' Day for several, several years signaled the end of advertising to women at all, and many ads in the vein of Men's Night went a step further and carried explicitly anti-women messages. Even as the popularity of the sport declined in the wake of the 1982 player strike and the rise of the popularity of the NFL, Major League Baseball teams refused to consider women fans as a priority. At all stages in its storied history, women have had to fight for their place in baseball. The only time that we are taken seriously is when economic necessity dictates it, and we are immediately discarded as soon as doing so is not detrimental to the sport, the team, or the bottom lines. The female experience at Major League Baseball games has always been influenced by and a mirror to society's reaction to women as political capital. As women have increased their public presence, their presence at baseball games works constricted. Giveaways patronizing women in both sense of the word have ranged from pink sequin feather boas to World Series replica rings, um, Mother's Day giveaways, uh, things like the, the, red, the White Sox bag, bag with the leopard print um, or a cosmetic, a cosmetic bag with the team logo. Um, the author of the book, Baseball Life Advice, accurately described this phenomenon when she wrote that sometimes it really feels like Major League Baseball believes it's females fans Consistent, consists solely of baseball knowledge impaired wine drinking moms dressed in pink. These sexist and gendered giveaways promote the myth that women aren't interested in watching baseball for the sake of the game itself. They're only showing up to games to bring their sons to drink distractedly with the girls or in a reluctant attendance with a boyfriend or husband. While often intended in jest, the sexist comments by the announcers emphasize that women are still not welcome in, in ballparks unless they enjoy the game the right way or the, men, the way the men would do it. We clearly have a long way to go until women are fully accepted as both players and fans, but the so-called Ladies' Day Riot of 1897 and the suffragette games of the late 1910s are but two examples of the ways women have been gathering and using baseball parks as hubs for both excitement and social change for more than a century. And there are my sources. All right, questions, thoughts, please. I'm not seeing too many in the comments, but if you guys want to either put it in the comments or you want to, you know, turn on your mic and ask it either way. Well, I have one actually. Um, what is the, uh, are there any statistics on like the kind of gender breakdown of attendance like during that time in terms of men and women when it wasn't ladies day like was there kind of that parody or do we know or at all that would there i found a really great paper um the one here the the lindsay parks piper um as, at least during the suffrage days she did a lot of research on that kind of information so for those years at least that's where i would look for that um, more research needs to be made on the early years, though. Um, that's not something that I have, I have looked at deeply, not the numbers, no. All right. There's a question from Catherine Forslund. Uh, how significant do you think baseball's involvement in supporting women's suffrage was to the overall efforts to get the vote? I think very, because like they pointed out, um, it was a way to bring the issue directly to the men that they needed to give them the vote. And it was when they got the players on their side, it was a way to show that you could support suffrage and still be masculine. And that was kind of a big thing for a lot of men. They thought that if they supported women's suffrage, then they couldn't also be manly. Um, but if their pl favorite players were doing it, then they could, you know, they could replicate that and they could also support it. So I think that it had a, a big, um, I mean, it was the, the most crucial part of it, but when you're talking culture, baseball is a big, a big piece of that. And it was very popular, especially in those years. So anything a baseball player did would resonate with the culture. So um, getting those, those players on board, I think it was a, a big deal for the women's movement then. They heard us. Did you uncover anything about women's suffrage baseball teams? 
There are there was some stuff um, that is is uh, stuff that I'm working on. Uh, the dissertation is in progress, <laughs> um, but the um, there yes. I, I don't have more specific information, but there were a couple of teams that did play. They would generally play before the um, the, the the main teams would play, the, the, the pro teams would play. Um, that was very common. And Leslie wants to know the topic of your dissertation. <laughs> it is baseball's relationship with women. Um, I'm basically using baseball as a, a cultural lens to look at how we treat women in, in, in American culture. Um, the, uh, if I said to a five-year-old boy, you play like a girl, that five-year-old boy would be very insulted. What does that say that we're teaching five-year-old boys about five-year-old girls? And every semester I have at least one football player in my classroom and 2% of, of college athletes then go on to play professional sports. That means those boys, in, those boys in my classroom, they can dream bigger than any girl in this country. And frankly, that makes me angry that those boys can dream bigger than girls in this country. And we see sports as this pure area and sports are, are, are so political. And we leave women out of all of this cultural capital that we give sports and that we give directly to men. And until we have a conversation or until we we were actually come to some sort of parity on a playing field, we're like athletic parity, we're never going to receive parity in other areas of life, literally, until we can become physically equal, we're not going to become any kind of other, get other kinds of equality. I think that's, this is where it starts. We have to literally even the playing field. M. Koran asks, what can be done about these false narratives that have been ingrained in the culture? More people doing more research and talking about it a lot more. There's, we need more of us the, you know, there's what, 40, 50 of us right now. We need hundreds of us talking about this. Um, I'm teaching on a university, uh, yeah. you know, at a university right now, and we're going to spend a week on my research. So I'm going to have at least 60 students out there thinking about sports and women. So we need more people taking those classes and, and having these conversations. We need more women represented in, in every aspect of the game because representation is so important. And some people have said, are we going to get our own Jacqueline Robinson? And I don't think that that should be the end goal at all. I think the end goal is recognizing that women have been a part of baseball since the very beginning and infusing us into the history as we have always been there. That should be the end goal. A couple people recommended the documentary Throw Like a Girl. Seen it, I'm assuming? Mm hmm Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, how do you define being equal physically? Um, I'm not using your phrase correctly. I'm not quite sure what that means. That's what I mean is I, I don't remember um, Becky's exact words, but just as an offhand statement, just a few paragraphs yeah. ago, she no. said, until we're equal physically. And I was like, oh, we need to talk about that because that's something yeah. they hold against women all the time. Yeah. Well, Scooter Jeanette is five, six hundred and sixty five pounds. Right. And when I was 13, I was playing softball because I never was given the option. I was playing softball with a girl who was six foot one and was throwing 70 miles an hour underhand. You know yeah. what I mean? So, I do. Yeah. My best friend in high school was, you know, she called it 512. Um, and we're talking about it in, in the 60s. And so, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm just saying, if you ranked, like when we get to the 40 man roster, because I'm bad at math. So there's 12, when we get to the 40 man roster, there's 1200 baseball players, right? So if you rank them one to 1200 athletically, you're telling me that there's not one girl in America that could outrun, out throw, out hit or out slide number 1200. I just don't buy that. And I just think that women should be given the opportunity to try out because there's plenty of women that can throw harder, hit harder, They've just never been given the opportunity to do so. And that's what I mean being equal because you don't need every skill to be a successful baseball player. You don't have to be 5'12 and 250, you know, to be a good baseball player. You can be 5'6, 165 pounds like Scooter Jeanette and hit four home runs in one game. 
you know, like there's all kinds of different ways that you can be in baseball and still be a very successful player. And I think that the only reason that women aren't playing this game today is because of sexism and the historical roots of sexism all through it, literally since Spalding calling it a manly game. And until we actually get women infused into the game, that it's ne there's never going to be parity there. Like the like football stadiums on, I use the example in class of the football stadium on campus. Just go stand in the middle of a football stadium and like on the 50 yard line in the middle and just feel how powerful it feels to stand there. And then try to feel or find an equivalent structure that glorifies women's athletics anywhere on campus. You won't find it anywhere on any campus anywhere. Right. And then we talk about so the, the at BGSU, all the all the salaries are public. The university president makes four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year. The football coach makes five hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year. The first assistant football coach makes one hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars a year. The assistant softball coach makes nine thousand dollars a year. Oh, nine thousand dollars. And that's what I'm talking about. And still, until we start getting some parity in all of these areas. You know what I mean? Like we, especially, but the, we have to be allowed to at least try out. Like I should be at least to be able to try out to be that football coach that makes $167,000. I should at least be able to try to be that baseball coach that makes whatever they make. You know what I mean? Instead yeah. of just an assistant softball coach that makes the $9,000 a year. It's just, it's so frustrating that our, our sex is holding us back and it's sexism a hundred percent cultural sexism. Absolutely. in my opinion yeah i agree uh, thanks yeah on that note um it is 1 30 so we are going to um go to the next presentation um thank you becky this was great uh i mean you guys can i guess message her privately if you have other questions yeah please do yeah so all right so we're going to move on to jay hurt thanks for allowing me to be here today guys Okay, there I am. All right. Yeah. Jay's presentation. Okay. Good. I'm there. So Jay is presenting on Lizzie Murphy breaking barriers. Um, do you need help loading your PowerPoint or do you need them? Yes, to I will Rockford? send that to you. Um, Jay, do you do want do you yeah. want me to just load mine? I have it in front of me. No, that's okay. I do have it okay. right here. Got it. Um, thank you. And Tara, thank you for being willing to sort. All right. Jay, if you need, I can share the screen. I have your PowerPoint. Okay. Well, I actually have loaded a different one on here. So, um, all right. This is very, I, I apologize here. This is, uh, oh, here we go. I'm sorry. It was right there. Right? It was where it was supposed to be. <laughs> Okay. All right, is that visible now? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great. Okay. Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here and I really uh, do appreciate all the um, sessions and, and the, the speakers and and all the insights, uh, I'm learning so much, and uh, I actually feel very, uh, very good about this. The whole idea of, of breaking barriers and realizing what, what um, people, what women have been up against in terms of um, being able to follow follow their dreams, and that's that's a, a big area of interest and study for me. Um, 
let me see. Now we've already seen the uh, this quote. We just saw it in, Be in Becky's presentation. All right here uh, about the how w women are really better suited just to remain in the grandstand and applaud brilliant play. But uh, I uh, I put in here with an assumption that numerous women, including Lizzie Murphy, ignored Spalding's declaration that baseball was off limits for women, which all gets me back to the, um, the things that have been very interesting for me in that I, I made a presentation to a local preservation society, to the Warren, Pres Warren Rhode Island Preservation Society. <clears throat> and I just started speaking about Lizzie Murphy. And I realized that I was making an assumption that when I talked about her being a woman baseball player, that people understood she was playing in men's leagues, but people were not aware of that. Uh, they thought she was just another nice woman who play, happened to play baseball. What's really amazing about Lizzie Murphy is that she played baseball on boys teams, men's teams, and she was actually paid as a, as a baseball professional. And uh, she even went on, as I'll show you later, that uh, she played on an all-star team versus the Boston, uh, a, a, an active Boston Red Sox roster in 1922. Uh, and this is from uh, uh, Leslie Heafy's book, Encyclopedia of Women in Baseball. And there's just mention of Lizzie Murphy as being the first female ever to play in Major League Baseball. And there, there are lots of other, there, I mean, there are other women who have claimed that, that honor. Uh, but what, as I'm going to mention in terms of the myths that have arisen around Lizzie Murphy, all of this uh, type of, I'll call it competition, uh, really, uh, it makes Lizzie Murphy a true baseball player because without the myths, without the question marks, without the other, uh, other, other aspects, um, which the, the legend would not, would not be here. Now, what I hope to do in here is to study history of women in baseball, of course, and to tell Lizzie Murphy's story a uh, woman playing baseball and exclusively with men's teams for nearly 20 years. And there are certain myths, stories about her, as I was implying. Uh, did she play up to 100 or more games per year? Uh, evidence from newspapers seem to indicate that that's true, uh, but I need to verify that. And then we have the myths that are attached to her life. And this is, as I say, a note to myself that these questions establish her as a professional baseball player, just having those myths attached to her life and career. And I have yet to find how she earned the nickname Spike. Lizzie was fairly obvious. Uh, she was born Mary Elizabeth Murphy. Uh, she became known as Lizzie. And later in life, uh, people who say they knew someone who knew her, said that she didn't, really didn't want to talk too much about her baseball career. And my impression is that she didn't talk about it so much is because she really, she loved it. She missed it. And she had to, when she retired, uh, after her husband died, she went back to work and just wanted to live her life, but she didn't forget where she came from. And I would also like to see Lizzie Murphy inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, or as I say here, at the very least, see more space dedicated to her and her achievements. And again, here's the quote from Spalding. Um, women just ought to sit in the grandstands. Now, the, the, the myths uh, is something that I've focused on. And these are, these are things that have been passed on over the years. As far back, I uh, found a paper as far back, 1941, which wasn't that long ago. Uh, but 
but that some of these things were being recorded, that she had a hit off of Satchel Paige. She played 30 years with the Bloomer Girls, which I find very hard to believe because she had uh, 17 to 20 years of playing on men's teams. But that's again, something that's reported. Um, and did she play first base at Rocky Point, Rhode Island for the Cleveland Colored Giants? And uh, Leslie has a very uh, more detailed discussion of the Cleveland Colored Giants who are a team not really from Cleveland, but that's beside the point. Um, and did she really speak French? Uh, her family was uh, French Canadian and supposedly she was in a ball game in, in Quebec and she listened to the opposing coaches talking about or talking about their plays and their signs. And she stole the signs because she was listening and just they, they were able, her team was able to win because she knew what the next play was going to be and so on. Um, she really did play in an American League All-Star game, but did she play versus National League players? Uh, we, we don't, I haven't been able to verify that. And then she, supposedly, she had, uh, had a 300 career average. And I haven't been able to verify that either. Um, so I'll just, it is true that Lizzie, an athlete, wanted to play baseball. She wanted to play baseball with the boys and later with the men. She wanted to be paid for her play as her abilities matched and exceeded those of men on the teams. She did not turn away from the barriers set before, before her. Rather, she broke them which is again, falling in with the theme of this uh, conference. And the, the, the myths uh, just continue. They're posted, this is on a baseball card, the back of a baseball card of Lizzie. And the, but this from 2003, just again, continues with the uh, unproven <laughs> myths. And again, here's the 1941 article where it talks about her hitting, getting the hits. So I, I'm spending a little extra time on this because if anyone knows anything about any of these, please, I would love to hear about it. Um, Lizzie was born in Warren, Rhode Island. Um, she, uh, uh, as they say around here, she was born and bred. Um, she had brothers and sisters. Um, her father played baseball. He worked at a mill in town, as did Lizzie and um, her, her sisters. And she learned about the game through, from her father. Again, this is, this is how the story is passed along and from her brother, Henry. And here we start getting, it gets kind of interesting with um, uh, Lizzie's life. This is um, a, a census report. And here you'll see that Lizzie's occupation is crossed out. She had been working definitely as in a mill as a spinner or, or at some other capacity there. But already in her life, the occupation is changing. And this is early in her life. And here's a Warren directory from 1910 when she would have been 16. And I think that this is, this is so amazing that um, Mary E being Mary Elizabeth or Lizzie, she is identified at, at 16 years old as a ball player. And I, I really, I uh, was very excited when I found that information. So these are some early photos of her. Um, she was a self-promoter. She, she had her own baseball cards, postcards, which she would sell at games. And uh, she definitely... Uh, she definitely brought fans into the stands. Now, the photo on the left, uh, Miss Murphy in baseball costume, it's a blow up of the photo from the article on the right. The, the outfit 
the costume that she's wearing does suggest Bloomer Girl, and that could be where some of the Bloomer Girl uh, stories came from. But even here, she was playing on men's teams. And I, I just love that one, uh, postcard. She would, sell, again, sell these at games and make extra money after she convinced her, her, manage, her manager that she was worth as much, um, if not more, than some of the other players on the team. And he realized that she was a draw, but it did take some talk, uh, talking him into it. She became, in a manner of speaking, professional baseball's first holdout. Not the first woman holdout, but first holdout, which uh, is, again, very debatable. Now, when I was asked, um, again, in Becky's presentation, she talked about the suffrage games, but there were the, the baseball um, there were baseball teams made up of women who were suffragettes. This happens to be the Newark women's suffrage team uh, at Fenway Park. Uh, and so, but Lizzie gets the same, same kind of billing along with this woman's team. And obviously you'll see the difference in the, in the bloomers versus her uniform, which she, um, she's now wearing the men's uniforms. One of the other, although there's so many interesting things in, in the study, uh, but I found reference to many other women ball players. And it seemed that so many towns, so many states, and this is nationwide, but here we are in, in Rhode Island. And there's a reference to the railroad team of the Narragansett Amateur League, a reference to the team's Margaret Sullivan. So there were other women playing in these leagues which leaves openings for lots of research. But uh, throughout her career, Lizzie was regarded as the very best. And uh, here's an early box score from uh, 1915. I've tried to keep this in somewhat of a chronological order here, uh, but you'll see that Lizzie is listed as Miss Murphy at first base. Bristol, uh, Rhode Island, where I live, and Warren, Rhode Island, uh, over the years had what they called their World Series. And uh, she, she participated in some of those games. You'll see Lizzie Murphy, the girl wonder, played first base for Warren Sunday in good style. And uh, I, I like this one, this shows her She's getting a little bit older, it's 1920, uh, but the inset of the photo is her after she had retired and, and when she was married. More information about, about her with the, the, the semi-pro team, uh, Providence Independence. But here she is, just one of the boys, and she took great pride in being called one of the boys. Uh, in one of her quotes, which I'll show you a little bit later, she, she does say that she was playing with the boys and men for a long time, and she knew all the, all the words, so she wasn't really uh, troubled by any, any swearing or, or other comments. But I, I, this is such a great photo with her, one of the boys, which um, that's, those are, are her words. Uh, here's another woman from South Boston, Millie Hill. Um, the fans are, are waiting with interest to the first appearance of Millie Hill. So she, Lizzie gets a little upstaged here, but it just opens the door again for more study. Now, I, I have a, a list of all the newspapers where she gets some mention, and there's probably a lot more than I have. But here's one out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1922 and mentions how much she is being paid on the, for the Cars All-Stars. But it's just interesting within this, you're following suit to what previous presenters have, have mentioned. Uh, but with becoming modesty, she says there's nothing to it. And that's playing baseball. Throwing into third isn't all Lizzie can do. She's fond of cooking, sewing in the films. 
and says she reads a little after a particularly hard day. And I don't know if while she was playing baseball, she actually did any of those things. But again, here she is, she signed the contract for 300 a week in 1923. Now I call this one an exciting find because it does uh, show, uh, there are other um, pieces uh, the, uh, the next day or the next week because there were some rainouts here, but she actually was on a team that played the Cleveland Color Giants at Rocky Point Park in Rhode Island. It doesn't say, I haven't been able to find anything that says that she played first base for the Cleveland Color Giants. And I can see where somebody could uh, misinterpret some of these articles, but uh, it's, it's like one, of the, one of those things that I really, I, I really want to believe that she did play with a, for the black baseball team, that she really did get a hit off Satchel Page. But um, I've learned that documentation is something I need to pursue. Now this is uh, from 1922 when uh, Lizzie played at Fenway Park. Uh, she was it was a, 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 a benefit game for Tommy McCarthy, who had cancer, and they raised a good amount of money. Uh, Lizzie Murphy was on an, on an All Star team with some with some um, active. Major leaguers, American leaguers, and some maybe who had recently recently retired, but she was playing against some active uh, roster Red Sox players. She wasn't in the game for very long, but she did appear. And uh, I, I love this uh, Harvey McClellan. He he was on her team. Yeah, he was at third base. He charged a slow roller and needed to hurry the throw to first. Lizzie stretched and made the put out to which McClellan said to pitcher Nick Altrack, she'll do. They really wanted her to fail. That, this is how the reports go, but she did not fail. She held her own. And uh, you can see that she's again identified as Miss Murphy in the box score. And I love these photos. This is uh, her as one of the all-stars. And uh, again, I just, I, I love the photos. Now I, I moved to Rhode Island from Medford. So I, I needed, to, <laughs> needed to include this, but there's it's a record of her being spiked and having to uh, quit the ball game. There are quite a few uh, articles, uh, pieces in the in papers about her, and uh, she definitely, again, was was the draw to a lot of these games. And uh, her her teams frequently made the newspapers. Again, more in the news. Uh, <laughs> this is one I it made me laugh, but. This guy, uh, Guy Irving Waltz, known as the clown poet, loved Lizzie. So he wrote this poem, Lizzie, Lizzie, you make me dizzy, the snappy way you play baseball. You're a hummer, you're a comer. Now knock a home runner and I'll throw you one kiss, that's all. She's the best in the land, Lizzie Murphy, she's grand. She'll show you lads how one and all. So tend to your biz and watch handsome Liz. Two men out, bases full, play ball. Oh, and this is a record from a game where she played in, in Newport. Uh, she played a 17-inning game, which, which her team lost, but it, it was quite a feat for her. <laughs> With the people reading this uh, article and seeing that a woman played 17 innings and she had nearly perfect fielding. This is an interesting piece that, again, she played a lot on the East Coast, New England, and into Canada. And this is something from Postmark Montreal. 
Um, I haven't, I think it says, dear Mary, I can tell enough to full a, a book. Some nice place to see here and talk about. I am lost with some people up here. I keep the money. Now, uh, whatever, and there were a couple of other words I couldn't make out, but this was, uh, I was very happy to see this one. Now, here's a, just, just some of the many newspapers where she um, gained attention. And you see Canada, um, Chicago, lots of New England, but it's just amazing the uh, coverage that she received. Muscatine, Iowa, in Austin, Texas. And uh, death notice in 1964 when she was 70. She had married Walter Larravee. Uh, and he, unfortunately, is only seven years into the marriage. This is after she had retired. Uh, he died, so he, she was, uh, again, on her own, but lived in Warren until the age of 70 and uh, passed. But you'll notice here, here it is with the local Rhode Island paper, the Newport Rhode Island, Rhode Island paper, and she also received attention in Ottawa and Canada. And here's her grave marker. Uh, the Buffard family... Uh, his sister married into that family, but she married into the Larravee family. There's no mention here of her having been a ball player. And I don't know if I can do anything to make that change, but we'll see what I can do. These are just some interesting quotes that, uh, that supposedly she said. Of course, they cursed and swore, but I didn't mind. I knew all the words. I thought that was funny. And uh, this is by a local artist. I, I think this is a fitting way to uh, end the presentation. It's a really beautiful uh, portrait of her. So that's what I have. And thank you very much for your patience. And if there's any time for questions, I'll try to answer them. I think we have time for maybe one or two, we have about three minutes. Um, so it's like Ryan Woodward asks, what are some obstacles getting Lizzie Murphy more recognition at the Hall of Fame and how can we support those efforts? Well, that I, I'm, I'm not sure. There's a, a, a friend of mine in Warren, Jay Ferreira, who has seen Tom Scheiber. He, uh, uh, this, this, this friend is kind of crazy. He and a few other people go to from Warren, Rhode Island, we'll drive to Cooperstown, which is a four to five hour drive, uh, four o'clock in the morning, spend the day, make a point of seeing Tom Shiver and then driving home. But uh, he keeps pushing to have more information about her at the hall and nothing yet, but I'm gonna uh, see what I can do to, um, to, to help to change that. And uh, we probably could ask one more question. Paulette Morant asks, are any of Lizzie Murphy's relatives available to provide further insights or memories? If there are, I, I haven't found them yet. And, that, and it's, this is so typical. I'm sure many of you in, in research have found that you, you try to track someone down and right away when I say, have you ever heard of Lizzie Murphy? And this is not just, you know, people my age or, or older, they say, no, I don't know who was Lizzie Murphy. And so just trying to get somebody to know about Lizzie Murphy. And um, maybe I should, I'm asking the wrong question. Maybe I should be asking about Elizabeth Larravee. That just occurred to me. And uh, maybe I can find more family that way. Uh, there is, she had a niece who she liked very much, who um, whose family is, is, still somewhere in town, but I haven't been able to track them down either. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get there, but I, I, I really do hope to get the insight from, from, from her family, from uh, churches or, or uh, some of the other locals. All right, so we're at two o'clock now. Um, anyone who has further questions for Jay, uh, Jay, you're gonna be on, they can message you privately, I guess. 
Oh yes, I can put a uh, yeah. send out an email. Yeah, just so they can just message you through Zoom or something like yep. that or whatever. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. We're gonna. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Tara. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Thank you, Jen. Great presentation. Um, next, we are going to move on to uh, Cat Williams on Edith Houghton. Uh, so, Cat, I assume. Yeah, you let me. Um, uh, let's see. Let me get my uh, uh, PowerPoint. Can I share my screen? Should be okay. able to. Um, we, the other uh, screen is being shared and I can't share mine. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Can everyone see that? I can see. Okay. Tara, do you want me to wait for a minute or should I go? No, you can start. It's okay. two, so you're right in your time. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope uh, everyone has at least heard of uh, Edith Houghton, but if not, then this is going to be a, uh, at least a nice introduction to her. I am uh, working on uh, a book about Edith Houghton, but this presentation uh, will be the first of my presentations about her. And while we will certainly go through her life story in baseball, um, the, the, the thread that runs through her story is really um, as much about the creativity and the determination of uh, girls and women to find a place to be a way to be part of baseball. This has been a thread in some of the discussions today. Um, you know, I wrote this uh, quote down that uh, Perry said uh, during that first panel, uh, women have uh, always been told, no, you can't. Um, but then we've always said, yes, we will. Hang on one second, I'm in a room that's... Sorry about that. We've got some technical issues here with my room. Um, so Perry's quote, women have always been told, no, you can't but we've always said, oh yes, we will. And that's exactly what Edith Houghton and every other person who's um, uh, wanted to, a woman that's wanted to be part of the game has done. And so that's going to be the thread that runs through this. Um, and some of that comes from my early experiences with um, um, being um, determined to find a place to, to play as well. And I ran across an Amelia Earhart quote um, many, many years ago, and it has guided me and it has guided me in a lot of the research I've done about women's baseball. The quote is this, some of us have great runways already built for us. If you have one, take off. But if you don't have one, realize it is your responsibility to grab a shovel, and build one for yourself and for those who will follow after you. That's a lot of what women and girls in baseball, that's a lot of what our history is. And so that's the thread that's gonna run through a lot of this story about Edith. Um, while Edith Houghton's baseball experience is hers alone, her story can be used to show how even in times of heightened conservatism, and even as women uh, retreated or were forced to retreat from other areas in society, um, we have always found a place. We've always found a way. And from Houghton's earliest days, she loved, played, and absorbed everything about baseball. Her life in, in baseball illustrates um, that love for the game, and it shines through in every single phase of her life. But something else shines through in every single phase of her life, and that is the creativity, the determination, the courage, the unwillingness to take no for an answer. And she is only one example, but she's a great example. 
Now, one of the things that we also find is that she is in many ways sort of hidden from this bigger history of, of women's baseball. Some people know about her, certainly. Mostly we don't. The only book that I've been able to find about her is a children's book that's quite good. But unfortunately, what that means is that here's this other lifelong story of how a woman was determined to be part of baseball. It's not common knowledge. And I think it's important that we that we change that. Um, from, you know, from the, the very earliest days, of course, women uh, were part of baseball, have been part of baseball since its inception. And certainly when, as we move through uh, just the early 20th century uh, in this country, we move through that history from the uh, late 19th century and into the early 20th century, you see the growth of the bloomer girls. You see, uh, certainly the 1920s, you see a widespread growth of bloomer girl teams, the Philadelphia Bobbies, who we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. Um, they are beneficiaries of all of that. As we move through a more conservative decade of the 1930s and the Great Depression, we certainly, uh, we certainly see examples of women saying, yeah, but we're still not going to give it up. During World War II, the same thing. During the socially conservative decade of the 1950s and beyond, women have made a place for themselves. Edith Houghton definitely made a place for herself. Her life in the game, showing, talking about her life in the game, allows us to see both the highs and the lows of women's baseball history, but, but even shows how during the decade of the 1930s, there was an actual effort to make baseball, rewrite baseball history to make it a male-centered game. But even through all of that, even through all of that, women's baseball has in many ways continued to grow. Even if it's had to be behind the curtain, behind the scenes, it's continued to grow. Certainly, Edith Houghton, as I said, provides us with an absolutely wonderful uh, story and also um, uh, great examples. From her very, and these are from her words, from her very earliest memory, Edith Houghton loved the game of baseball. She loved holding the ball, the feel of it, the smell of it, and the sound it made when it hit her glove. Edith Houghton was born in Philadelphia on February 12, 1912, and according to her, that was, quote, the day I started loving baseball. I was born with a baseball in my hand. She played, and this is a familiar story to many of us, she played um, with uh, all kinds of uh, boys in the neighborhood, uh, brothers and cousins. She played in dusty fields and on the streets. Um, she certainly spent a lot of time watching baseball games. She would go to baseball games with her father and other members of her family. Uh, by the time she was eight, she was an on-field mascot for the local police leagues. And then the, the next season, by the next season, she was performing hitting and fielding displays on the field before the games. But around the age of 10, Edith Houghton got word that the Philadelphia Bobbies traveling team, uh, again, uh, uh, much like the Bloomer Girls that we are used to seeing pictures of from um, the 19th century. The, the Philadelphia Bobbies were created by Mary Agara. Um, and they, she, uh, Edith found out that they would be holding tryouts um, in, uh, near her home in Philadelphia. Despite her age, again, 10 years old, and her size, she was very small, even for age 10. She was determined to try out. But as I said, Edith, while she was only 10, she had already benefited from, from decades and decades of women's baseball history. Here you see Maud Nelson. There are, I could spend an hour talking about all the different examples of Bloomer Girl teams, but it's important here to understand that the Bobbies existed 
because of these Bloomer Girl teams and because of the teams, the women who benefited from that long history. The Bloomer Girl teams, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of that history. Many of you know that. And I will just say, if you have an interest in it, if you haven't already read Deb Shattuck's book on 19th century women's baseball, please do so. It is one of the best. Um, but these Bloomer Girl teams were certainly, um, of course, they were named after the, the uh, style of pants they wore. Um, and in the beginning, some of them, I think, were certainly novelty type teams. But these women played baseball. Many of them became very highly competitive uh, baseball players. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is uh, uh, from the Western uh, Bloomer Girls. These are serious baseball players. Um, these women, again, traveled throughout um, the country playing baseball. They often had um, a male battery, um, but they, they certainly were primarily um, women's teams. One of the things that happens in, as we move into the first decade or so of the 20th century, and certainly by the time Edith is getting ready to try out, one of the things that we start to see is that more and more of these Bloomer Girl teams have traveled around the country. Therefore, more and more people are seeing women on a baseball field. They're seeing young girls playing. The game became more popular. Women in the game became more popular. So it starts to become, I don't want to say commonplace, but it's, it's, it's more acceptable. So you start to see girls playing, uh, again, out in fields, on streets, but then you, on a Saturday or a Sunday, you get dressed up and you go to a field, you go to a game where women are actually in uniform playing ball. And that goes a long way in uh, spreading the popularity of baseball, but certainly the popularity of women in baseball. And it goes a long way in helping to create other more competitive teams like the Bobbies. The Bloomer Girl teams, as I said, grew in popularity and in number well into the 20th century. And, you know, we can't overlook the fact too that while that's happening, in the decade of the 1920s, women are, have more opportunity in education. Uh, women have finally earned the right to vote. Women have become social reformers and political activists and, and frequently um, workers. So society is changing and there are more opportunities for women in the game. Believe me, Edith Houghton, even at the age of 10, she was willing to step up and take advantage of that. Because as she said in later years, when she was interviewed, I needed it. I had to have it. I needed baseball. I needed it like air. So yeah, Edith in 1922 at age 10, she did indeed try out for the Philadelphia Bobbies. Now, Agara, Mary Ogara, who ran the team, usually didn't try out girls who were um, younger than 13, but Edith Houghton's talent impressed her. And by 10, age 10, Edith Houghton became the shortstop for the Philadelphia Bobbies. This picture of her is very famous. And if you've seen her at all, uh, or know anything about her, you've likely seen this. Her nickname, of course, was The Kid, as you can imagine. There are some fabulous stories and some other pictures that show her that didn't have uniforms to fit her because she was so small. So she had to pin her uniform up, to hold her pants up, pin the, the hat. Um, but she was an amazing ball player. Now, many of you uh, likely know uh, if, if, again, if you know anything about uh, the Bobbies, you, you are well aware of their uh, ill-fated trip to Japan. And, and again, this is another whole presentation, but I want to just mention it here. Um, prior to, to going on an exhibition tour to Japan in 1925, the Bobbies had traveled around the Northeast and played other teams, of course, locally. Um, Edith Houghton continued to play shortstop. She continued to be one of the best players on the team. But prior to 1925, there had been a number of uh, male 
uh, teams that had gone to um, Asia. A lot of uh, Japanese uh, businessmen combined with American businessmen and the, the sort of male control business of baseball that had done very successful exhibition tours. They were well planned, they were well funded. And so one of the men that had been on, one of the players that had been on one of those very successful um, uh, uh, exhibition tours was a catcher named Eddie Ainsmith. Eddie Ainsmith was convinced that uh, he and Mary O'Gara could take the get promoters and take the Bobbies to Japan to play exhibition games. He filled them full of ideas about how much money they would make and so on. And as I said, I'm given a, a sort of, uh, you know, nutshell version of this story in order to sort of move, move through it. Um, but suffice it to say, this exhibition tour was neither well-planned nor well-funded. Um, the team got there. There are some amazing photographs of people, uh, you know, welcoming them with open arms. They played a few games. And honestly, many of the players were not all that great. Um, Edith was uh, very popular in the Japanese press, um, but um, the promoters backed out while they were there. And uh, Eddie Ainsmith, uh, with, along with his wife and uh, two others who were uh, working with him, uh, left and sort of abandoned uh, min most of the players. Um, they went on uh, hoping to, to, to continue to play some exhibition baseball. He took a couple of players with him. Um, unfortunately, the women were stranded um, and because of the help of some uh, very generous um, uh, American businessmen, but also Japanese businessmen. They gave them the money. Uh, they did indeed get home. Unfortunately, the two ball player, or three ball players that had gone with the Ainsmiths, they were abandoned as well by Ainsmith and his wife. And uh, they came uh, back across uh, the ocean on an ocean liner by themselves. And unfortunately, one of the young women was swept overboard and died. Um, this is a very tragic story. And I have um, copies of a um, uh, scrapbook um, from, some, from some of the players. I and read, uh, read numerous interviews, both from Edith and some of the other ball players. And, and it was a horribly tragic story. Um, yet what's filled, what the, the scrapbook is filled with, oh my God, all of these amazing stories about how we got to play baseball here. We got to do part, we got to be part of this baseball team there. Um, and certainly when, Edith, when they returned, when they did return to the US, um, as you can imagine, um, uh, you know, Edith did not stop looking for a place to play. She continued to play with the Bobbies for a short time, but eventually um, she did, she did leave the team and sought other places to play. And in fact, she sought men's teams and played on some men's teams. Um, eventually, she played every position on the diamond, including pitcher and catcher. Um, she was invited to play for the Margaret Nables uh, New York Bloomer Girls, which she did. She sought out all kinds of teams. But of course, by the time that's happening, we're getting into the decade of the 1930s and we're getting into, of course, the Great Depression. By the 1930s, not only are we moving into the worst economic depression the country had ever seen, we were also uh, inter wading into this rise in popularity of softball. We're wading into a very organized effort to redefine baseball as masculine. All of that's coming together at the same time. And so one of the things that happens, of course, is that people, uh, girls and women like Edith, who have been playing baseball for decades, um, really were kind of told, yeah, no thanks. We don't really need you anymore. Um, but here's softball. And, and you really should play softball. Um, and baseball is a masculine sport. Well, the problem with that, of course, is while we all love softball, softball is not baseball. 
Edith resisted softball. She sought, um, she sought a number of um, uh, all-male teams, uh, co-ed teams, any number of places to be part of, um, be part of the game. Women were given very few opportunities to play. And as I said, they were pushed hard into softball. But kind of one of the worst things about this whole scenario in the 1930s is that the women like Edith and, and, and Maude Nelson and many, many other women who had played, who had umpired, coached, owned the teams and managed the business of baseball were basically removed from the annals of baseball history. It was completely reworked so that it would follow what they wanted it to follow. And that is that it was a very masculine game. Unfortunately for Edith and, and a lot of other women who wanted and needed to play baseball, she um, didn't have a lot of options and she did switch to softball. Functioning within the social confines of the 1930s, women's softball games really reached tremendous heights. It was extremely popular and professional teams traveled across the country drawing all kinds of fans. Edith Houghton played with the New York um, Roverettes, Madison Square Garden. I mean, there was no, there, there was no shortage of places uh, for girls and women to play softball. But, it wasn't baseball. And Edith Houghton, along with so many others, continued to push for the one place, that any place, any way they could be part of the game they loved. Again, they kept being told, no, you can't, but they kept saying and actually creating opportunities that said, oh, yes, we will. So even if all they could do was play softball. And again, I don't mean to say it in a way that diminishes softball, but, but if that's all they could do, if that's as close as they could come to baseball, Edith Helm was going to do that. Now, of course, you know, as, as, as you all know, as we get into uh, World War II era, then there are things change for women in general. Women have a lot more opportunity because we're, quote, needed. On, in the war effort, in the factories, um, and of course on the baseball fields. Most of you, of course, know the history of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Um, that starts in 1943, but it's not baseball, it's softball. And, and even this league that we celebrate because of their history in women's baseball, for the first several years, it was softball. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what it does is give us an indication of how women were pushed to play softball. Yeah, we'll give you a league. We're going to give you uniforms and we're going to make you uh, famous, but it has to be through softball. Eventually, of course, the All-Americans do uh, change, to, change to baseball. But the, one of the things that, that's, that's so important in Edith's story and is so important to me is that um, she, like millions and millions of other people, when the war called, when her country called, she answered. Edith Houghton served in the, in the waves during World War II. And yet that did not stop her desire or her need to be connected to baseball. She was actually in the waves uh, for, for a very long time. Edith, um, ultimately, I think it was something like 28 years. I'm looking for those numbers. Um, she was in uh, the waves during World War II, but then was also um, uh, called back into service during the Korean War and uh, during Vietnam. But when she joined the waves, she became a clerk and she figured, you know, I'll just continue to find whatever opportunities I can to play baseball. Well, those opportunities came up pretty fast. 
um, because the all male Bureau of Supplies and Accounts baseball team needed an extra player. Edith stepped up and that baseball turned softball superstar turned baseball uh, player. Um, Edith Houghton played as the only woman on the uh, Navy team. But, you know, that was okay because they just needed her. They weren't really, she wasn't challenging their masculinity, really. But as soon as that guy came back, and as soon as more and more women started joining the waves, they tapped Edith to create and run a women's softball league for the waves, which she did, which she did. And, and yet again, she was pushed from baseball to softball. Now, we can continue. You got the picture, right? We can continue this story. Um, Edith did indeed uh, leave uh, the army and in the post-war years immediately started to seek more opportunities to play the game. Those opportunities were few and far between, unfortunately. But Edith Houghton was never going to be one to say no. She was never going to be one to say, okay. Instead, and by the way, just so you know, she was a huge, and until the day she died, a huge Philadelphia Phillies baseball fan. In 1946, the Phillies were the last place team, and Edith Houghton got her scrapbook, walked into the office of the uh, Phillies president, Bob Carpenter, and said, you know what? You don't have any um, women scouts. I have been part of baseball my whole life. I've been part of baseball as a player, as a coach. I know baseball. Why don't you hire me? Two weeks later, she found out that she would be scouting prospects in the Philadelphia suburbs on many of the fields that she had played on. She scouted for the Phillies from 1946 to 1952. During that time, she signed 16 players, although none of them reached the majors. But you know what? The thing is, all of these examples, and again, I'm going through them really fast here. When you start digging into a lot of these stories, what you see is an amazing determination, an amazing talent. Um, but if we go through all of these stories and we get to Edith Houghton, who, by the way, died one day short of her 101st birthday. If we get, if we go through all of those stories, we get to see firsthand, almost in flesh, um, the, the story of this extraordinary um, determination and success that women and girls have always shown in baseball. Don't tell us we can't. And don't tell us we weren't ever part of it. We've always been part of it. And, and as I said, I'm currently writing a book about, about Edith and it will, it will talk about all of this, but the thread that will always run through it is, this is one really amazing example of how we, um, we make our way. We're not afraid. Listen to the stories again of those umpires we heard from this morning. You tell them you can't, you break their arm, you break their leg, it doesn't matter, we're gonna do it. And Edith Houghton is a prime example of that. Edith Houghton is a prime example of what Amelia Earhart said. If you don't have a runway, grab a shovel and build one and make sure that you do what you can to help the people coming behind you. That's the Edith Houghton story that I wanna get out. And I think that is about time. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, we, uh, yeah, we're, we're just about coming up on the break here. It's about uh, 2.30. Um, so we will take a 15 minute break. Um, you guys can stretch your legs, grab a snack, whatever you need to do. And we will be back at 2.45 uh, with our next presentation. Um, great presentation so far, everyone.
Thank you. All right, so it looks like it's 2.45. Um, so our next panelist is Michael Rusco doing uh, Women on the Ball Field, Breaking Baseball's Ultimate Barrier. Um, again, everyone, um, just, you know, if you're not presenting, please uh, turn off your video, mute your audio, and if you have any questions, put them in the comments box. It's, okay, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be amongst you virtually. I wish I could be amongst you uh, uh, in person. Um, I know there are probably a number of um, uh, bar owners in the South Side who wish I was there in person, but uh, I'm here uh, representing my Hartford Yard Goats. I know they came up yesterday during one of the panel discussions. Uh, I'm about 20 miles south of Dunkin' Donuts Park where the Yard Goats play and um, very happy to be talking to you today. Um, all right, in March, 1947, Brooklyn Dodgers manager, Leo DeRocher gathered his players for an impromptu late night meeting in the kitchen of the team spring training hotel. The subject, a petition that several Dodger players had been circulating in which they objected to the inclusion of an African-American man as a member of the team. DeRocher told his players in forceful, colorful, and no uncertain terms that if Jackie Robinson could help Brooklyn win the pennant, he would be a Dodger come opening day, and any player who objected to it would be traded from the team. I'll play an elephant if he can do the job, DeRocher famously said, and to make room for him, I'll send my own brother home. Of course, Robinson played that year, read, led Brooklyn to the pennant, and changed the course of American history. Despite DeRocher's promise, no elephants have ever suited up for a big league game. But since Robinson's rookie season, Major League Baseball has been played by legions of African-American ballplayers, as well as players from a host of different countries, including the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Mexico, Canada, Japan, Colombia, South Korea, Aruba, Australia, the Bahamas, Germany, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, Peru, and Taiwan. Even the tiny nation of Curacao has sent five players to the big leagues, despite having a population of only 165,000. Baseball has similarly opened its doors for disabled players, having seen Pete Gray, a one-armed outfielder, play for the St. Louis Browns two years before Robinson's debut. And many of us here at this conference are old enough to remember seeing Jim Abbott throw a no-hitter against the Cleveland Indians, despite having been born without a right hand. Apparently, ball clubs have agreed with DeRocher that only nice guys finish last, and teams are willing to play anyone, or almost anyone, to avoid landing in the basement come October. Considering Major League Baseball's longstanding global reach for talent, it seems downright ludicrous that the sport has denied playing time to more than half the American population. Of the four major American sports, Baseball is the only one that depends on speed and skill as much as or possibly more than it does size and strength, and yet countless supremely talented athletes are barred from playing the game simply because they're women. If Leo DeRocher would have played an elephant in order to win the pennant, surely he would have started a slick fielding woman at second base, or placed a knuckleball tossing woman on the mound, or played a speedy woman with a sure bat in his outfield. The time for women to be allowed to play Major League Baseball isn't just now, the time is long overdue. In the interest of diversity and inclusivity, for the good of the sport and as a matter of national pride, women should be permitted to play alongside men on the Major League field beginning immediately. Can women play Major League Baseball? Of course they can. Sabre and this conference are replete with stories of women who have competed against their male counterparts successfully. We've all heard the story of Alta Weiss, who paid for her medical school education by pitching semi-pro ball from 1906 through the mid-1920s. We know all about Jackie Mitchell, who used her 12 to 6 curveball to strike out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig during an exhibition game in 1931. And stories abound about Tony Stone, who as a member of the Indianapolis Clowns of the Negro League recorded a hit off the legendary Satchel Page. And women ball players, as we know, aren't just regulated to stories of the past. As many of you know, in the spring of 2017, Melissa Mayu, a young shortstop from France, was placed on her country's under 18 junior national team. As a result, she made history as the first female baseball player added to MLB's international registration list, making her eligible to be signed by a major league team. 
She's got great hands, said one college coach who saw early video of Mayu's play. She's got power when she swings, and obviously I could tell that she had a great work ethic. Then there's Chelsea Baker, who at age 13 was using a 60 mile an hour fastball and the knuckleball taught to her by Joe Negro to throw two perfect games and send her opponents to the bench in tears. Chelsea has a good delivery, said former major league general manager, Dan Duquette. I saw that she throws downhill and I also saw that she has good life on her fastball and she's a good competitor. I can see that she has a real passion for the game. Baseball is the greatest game and everyone should have a chance to play, said Dr. Justine Siegel, the, former, uh, the founder of Baseball for All, an organization that promotes women playing the sport. There are women playing alongside men in colleges, leagues, and the occasional independent teams. Baseball has no gender. Certainly there are differences between the way men and women play. A study by the Journal of Applied Biomechanics showed that men's and women's bodies function differently when throwing a baseball. For pitchers, the length of a woman's stride towards the plate is shorter. The rotation of the hips while keeping the shoulders closed, a vital component in generating velocity, isn't always the same. Elbow velocity is similarly lower in women than in men, the study showed. Still, the first woman ball players don't have to arrive with a 100 mile per hour Jacob deGrom fastball or the brute strength of a Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And there are far more important qualities than size and strength needed to play the game. Major League Baseball has seen a long line of diminutive players such as Phil Rizzuto of the New York Yankees, David Eckstein of the Los Angeles Angels, and Dustin Pedroia of the Boston Red Sox, just to name a few, all of whom enjoyed long and successful careers without possessing the size and brute force of many of their teammates. In other words, when searching for the first woman ball player, we're not necessarily looking for another Aaron Judge or Pete Alonso. Instead, the first woman to play Major League Baseball could easily be a female version of Ozzie Albies or Jose Altuve. Consider what former Arizona Diamondback and two-time All-Star Steve Finley had to say about Mayu, the French shortstop. What she really did well was make adjustments quick, he said. You could have her do a quick adjustment on the spot and she'd take it right into the game. That's really one of the key things that makes her such a good player. Melissa is a warrior, said Hall of Famer Barry Larkin, a former shortstop with the Cincinnati Reds. I was very encouraged by her understanding of the game and her technique. I think it showed even more because she physically wasn't as strong as some of the boys, but she paid more attention and became a leader. So where might the first woman ball players come from? To find them, we, we need look no further than collegiate ball, traditionally the well from which most major league ball players spring. According to a recent Sports Illustrated article, a record six women played for collegiate teams this year, and a movement to make women's baseball a collegiate sport is gaining momentum. The names of many of these players are already familiar to some of you at this conference. One player, Skylar Kaplan, grew up playing baseball and eventually made the team at Anne Arundel Community College in Arnold, Maryland. While pitching for the River Hawks, she struck out 11 top Division I NCAA prospects in 11 and two thirds innings of work in her first season. I know a few guys on the college team already from playing with them or against them through the years, Kaplan told the magazine. The ones who had no idea who I was, once they saw me hit and pitch for the first time, they were like, okay, she's good. That's all I need to know. For Beth Greenwood, a catcher for the University of Rochester, the transition to college baseball came with extra pressure. Everyone is going to look at you whether you like it or not, she said. You feel like you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. And sometimes when you're playing, you feel like you're playing for all the girls and women in baseball. It can be hard to separate that and remember that you're just a baseball player like anyone else. But having all those eyes on you is a privilege. It's a privilege to be here and have those opportunities because I didn't know this was possible when I was younger. One of the biggest obstacles these women have had to face in their development as ball players, of course, is society's propensity to automatically shift them to softball as it tried to do with Baker and Mayu. Baker tried softball, but according to Rod Mason, her stepfather and coach, she didn't like it, so baseball is her deal. On the basis of early videos that she sent to, you, to the United States, Mayu was offered a full scholarship to play softball at Miami-Dade College, which she accepted. Marika Lizek, a catcher and pitcher for Riviera University in Nashville, New Hampshire, 
was one of the many women who chose to buck that trend. My mom assumed that I wanted to play with the girls, so she put me in softball, she said. A lot of times girls switch over to softball because they don't feel comfortable with the guys or feel, or feel intimidated by them. But you shouldn't have to switch to softball. Baseball and softball are two very different games. Luisa Gauchi is a second baseman for Green River Co Community College in Auburn, Washington. Even now, some people ask me if I'm interested in switching to softball, and they mentioned that there, would, that there would be a lot more scholarship money for me in softball, she said. The money in getting to play at a Division I school entices me, but I'm so passionate about baseball, and I love it so much that if I played at a Division I school, I would just be mad that I'm not on the baseball team. Ball players like these are signs that the barrier keeping women from playing Major League Baseball is cracking. And it's not hard to imagine that one day those cracks will eventually reach the professional and major league level. In the end, people who oppose women playing baseball have no reason to bar them from the game other than the same reason that was used for so many generations to keep African-Americans from playing. And that is, we just don't want them to play. And not only is that reason not good enough in the 21st century, but it may be keeping us from actually saving the game we love a game that whether we want to admit it or not is in peril. Consider this cold hard fact. Major League Baseball as we know it is currently killing itself. The average age of today's typical baseball fan is a shocking 57 years old, which is younger than me, but that certainly doesn't make it young enough. Regular season attendance even before the pandemic is down and viewership of the World Series, the baseball's grandest event is plummeting. Our national pastime is in danger of becoming a regional curiosity in which diehard fans in New York, Boston, and Chicago take a measured interest, but the nation as a whole finds little fascination. And what has been MLB's reaction to all of this? The league is nipped and tucked at pace of play rules as if a two hour and 50 minute game will be more attractive than the exact same game played in three hours and 10 minutes. Accusations of baseballs being juiced and dejuiced, all in the interest of man, mo, ma, uh, manipulating action during games, fly around like Shohei Otani home runs. And in an effort to raise interest as well as cash, MLB is cozying up with online companies that allow viewers to bet on games, both in advance and in progress, something that would have been a cardinal sin when I began watching the sport back in the late 60s. But even with all these changes, baseball is failing in, in, the, in its efforts to attract new fans, while rule changes only serve to alienate its most loyal ones. Viewership continues to decline, and potentially younger fans, the ones with the most disposable income and the most time on their hands, in other words, the very people we need to hand the game down to future generations, continue to be lost, not only to other traditional sports, but to the myriad of pastimes offered online. Someday, my friends, you and I will go the route of Leo DeRocher and we'll walk up the tunnel to that great locker room in the sky. And if something isn't done soon, we'll take the great game of baseball with us. There is, however, a ray of good news in the midst of this gloom. The game we love can be saved if we were to embrace MLB's fastest growing audience, women. According to a recent USA Today article, the gender that's not even allowed to play the game is flocking to it in droves. In fact, the audience for ESPN's national baseball broadcast has grown a staggering 83% among women between the age of, ages of 18 and 34, the demographic sweet spot for those in the industry. Surveys show that attendance by women at MLB games is also rising. And today, a full 45% of women in America describe themselves as either avid fans or casual fans of the sport. Now imagine with these numbers in mind, the level of interest in the game if a woman were to finally break MLB's gender barrier. Instead of being a footnote in the sports pages of a dying local newspaper, the games in which this woman plays will be a nonstop headline in a 24 hour news cycle. This pioneering woman, woman will be a household name as will the, be the women who follow her. And think of the multitude of fans, both men and women, whose fascination for the game would be reignited by the exploits of these new players. Today, the names of the top players in baseball are barely known in the public outside the sport. You don't believe me? 
See how many average Americans on the street have heard of LeBron or Tiger Woods or Tom Brady. Then see how many of them have heard of Mike Trout or Mookie Betts or Fernando Tatis Jr. The names of the first women to play Major League Baseball, though, will become legendary in an instant, and these women will catapult the game to a new level of international relevance. There's precedent in the world of sports for allowing women to compete alongside men. This past summer, the Olympics began busting gender barriers when it expanded the number of dual gender competitions beyond the traditional mixed doubles tennis. Men and women competed against one another in relay racing, swimming, and the triathlon so that the games would, quote, be more youthful, more urban, and include more women, according to International uh, Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach. But if that's not flashy enough for you, if you want to reach the kind of pizzazz that MLB is fruitlessly searching for with play, pace of play rules and online betting, consider the WWE. In 2016, the pro wrestling behemoth took its women performers, known then as divas, and rebranded them as superstars, the same term used for male wrestlers. In doing so, it launched a so-called women's revolution in pro wrestling, headlined by such performers as Sasha Banks, Bailey, Charlotte Flair, and Becky Lynch, who is ironically nicknamed the man. The popularity of the women's division exploded, and before long, the talent, action, and interest in the women's division outshone even that on the men's side. Women superstars became tremendously popular amongst the entire WWE audience, men and women. So much so that in 2019, three women, Flair, Lynch, and former mixed martial arts champ Ronda Rousey, competed in the headline match at WrestleMania, the industry's equivalent to the Super Bowl, an event witnessed by hundreds of millions of avid fans around the world. Just as they have in other arenas, the inclusion of women athletes would change the tenor of big league baseball and definitely for the better. In an age in which MLB is practically doing Ozzie Smith style backflips in an effort to increase the action on the field, women baseball players will inject a style of play in the game that will make it more attractive to audiences, both old and new. Audiences who crave the very action for which baseball is searching. Today, thanks to the game's obsession with analytics, Batters emphasize the uppercut and too often swing for the fences, resulting in a record number of one boring strikeout after another. Defensive infield shifts take away what would have once easily been base hits while turning routine ground balls into accidental doubles that dribble into the outfield. Woman ball players, however, will bring back a style of play based on speed, skill, and excitement. The very tone of the game itself will change becoming new again by returning to what made it great in the first place. The hit and run, the bunt base hit, the triple, the inside the park home run, baseball's most exciting and action packed plays, the ones that have gone the way of the four fingered glove and the woolen uniform in today's age of stifling analytics will return when women who depend on speed and skill to play the game finally get their chance to take the field. This vital change to the game must also be implemented as both matters of social justice and national pride. Eight years before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus, and 16 years before Dr. King gave his legendary I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C., Jackie Robinson touched off the modern American civil rights movement when he took the field for the Dodgers. Baseball can similarly launch a new era in equal rights for women, an era in which young fans can grow up watching their male and female heroes play and compete besides, beside one another once a woman ball player suits up for a major league team. Furthermore, considering the inroads that women are making into baseball and recognizing that it's only a matter of time before they begin to push against MLB's gender barrier, it becomes clear that this historic event must take place here in the United States. The Japanese have already allowed a woman, a sidearm knuckleballing pitcher named Eri Yoshida, to play in a professional independent league. But the nation that ultimately gave Jackie Robinson the chance to play big league ball must be the first to give the same opportunity to a female player at the major league level. After all, America is the country that tells its people that you can go as far as your talents and skills take you as long as you work hard enough. MLB can no longer tell half the country's population that
that this most basic of American principles does not apply to them. It would be a national disgrace if the honor of being the first female ball player, an honor representing a fundamentally American ideal manifested in the most fundamentally American sport was finally bestowed upon a woman in another country. Baseball is the greatest game, said Dr. Siegel of Baseball for All. Everyone should have a chance to play it. It's a stain on American sports that girls are still told they can't play baseball. I don't think the game is discriminatory male or female, Larkin said. If there's a female that's capable of physically doing it and has the skills to do it, then I don't think there's any, hold, that there's any holding back. I don't care if you're a man or a woman, either you can keep up or you can't, Finley said. The sport will let you know how far you can go. And I think that's true of anybody. If you're a man or woman, I don't care. If you have the talent and ability to play at the big league level, go for it. Of course, the first woman ball player in the major leagues will have to be an extraordinary person. She'll have to be, quote, a woman of great fortitude and moral courage, Dr. Siegel said. She would have to play not just for herself, but for all the girls who have been told they couldn't, close quote. This woman will face unimaginable obstacles and pressures. She'll, have an, she'll be the object of scorn and derision by many, but to millions more, she'll be a hero. She'll be revered, and like Jackie Robinson, her name will be remembered throughout history. More importantly, for Major League Baseball, she'll move an unimaginable number of jerseys and t-shirts. She'll inject new energy into the game, and she'll put our national pastime on the top of every newscast and in the forefront of the international consciousness. That woman is out there somewhere, toiling on a remote ball field, waiting for her chance to make history. All she needs is for Major League Baseball to give her the, ch give her the time at bat that she deserves. And if none of this is convincing enough, listen to Leo DeRocher, who insisted he'd play an elephant if he could do the job. Personally, I'm with Leo, and as a New York Mets fan, if a woman could help my team win the title that's eluded us for 35 years, I would meet her at LaGuardia Airport and carry her to City Field on my back. I'd wear her name on my shirt, I'd cheer for her from the stands, and I'd watch with pride as she takes her first pitch, finally proving that baseball is truly a national pastime played by an entire nation. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. And um, I will be posting my sources on my website, michaelrusco.com. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna see where the question. Um, looks like, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Looks like Jay Hurd asks, when I have had the opportunity to speak with MLB players, coaches at all, um, and I ask about women playing Major League Baseball, they reply, yes, let them play. Perhaps bringing this issue to sports talk shows should be a starting point. I'm sorry, perhaps what should be? Bringing this point? issue to sports talk shows should be a starting point. That would be great. And I think that since there are so many, well, since there are more women than there used to be hosting sports talk shows, uh, that might be a natural topic. Um, I, I think that would be a, an excellent idea. I think, I think it's an idea that if people started talking about, it, it might be one that could take hold. Uh, Woody Eckerd says, should MLB develop a quote, retraining program to convert the multitude talented female softball players to baseball? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the one who's qualified to answer it. Um, I haven't played a lot of softball, if any. Um, I'm not sure how the transition would be between baseball and softball. I would be very interested in hearing how many women softball players would be interested in playing professional baseball and ultimately major league baseball. I think that would be a very interesting thing to find out. Let's see. Uh, let's see any other actual questions? Looks like there's just a lot of discussion about this topic. Um, mm -hmm. Wait, did something just, I mean, no, just a lot of questions, a lot of kudos. Um, actually, I had one um, specifically. I, I was wondering, because the, the difference between like male and female bodies in terms of, you know, where their strengths are. And I'm wondering whether or not 
it would just be a different game with women in it because women can do different things than men can do, basically. I, I think that now the, the study that I quoted um, admittedly was a, a smaller, a small sample of people. I, I'm not sure that that study uh, uh, is, is absolutely definitive. Uh, the, the differences in the bodies that I quoted certainly are, diff are, are definitive. Um, but I think baseball is better when people who do different things get to play, you know, um, uh, imagine watching baseball and not being able to have seen, um, an Ichiro Suzuki, uh, play next to, uh, uh, Ken Griffey Jr. You know, different ball players today have different bodies and they do different, they, they accomplish different things. Um, from the time that I played on the ball fields at school as a boy to the major league games I watch now, baseball is better when everyone gets to play because everyone adds something different to it. Um, uh, so I only think, I, I think that, yes, probably the way men and women play probably is different. I don't think that's a problem. I think that could be to baseball's benefit. I would love to see what uh, some of the most talented women can do on the field. Um, as I mentioned in the paper, I'm, I'm tired of watching uh, uh, guys just strike out all the time because they've been told, um, you know, don't give up in at bat by hitting the opposite way or by sacrificing or by doing all the things that make the game the game. You know, I'm tired of seeing guys hit into shifts all the time when they could easily hit the other way and get a base hit. Um, I think that that there are things that women ballplayers, when their game is based on speed and skill, I think there are great things they could bring to the game that we're missing out on. That's a good point. Uh, Cecilia Tan asks, what do you think about MLB's current diversity efforts? Um, I think they're commendable. I know that um, I know that MLB has been concerned with the drop off of African American players, and they're doing a lot to reach out to African American youth, to inner city youth. Um, I think that's all commendable. Um, I think MLB though is kind of missing the boat by by not only not allowing women to play, but not reaching out to have women to play. Uh, with not reaching out to have women play. Um, it, it would do so much good for the, the game in terms of play, in terms of publicity. Uh, uh, again, it would put, it would instantly put Major League Baseball at the top of every news cycle uh, were women given a pass to play Major League Baseball. And uh, Ryan Schroer asks, and actually this is a question that um, I'm interested in too, is it more likely that a women pro league is formed um, like the WN, WMLB or something than having oh, women like, in Like, in, like yeah. an equivalent to the WNBA? Yes, exactly. He wrote WNBA actually. <laughs> would it, yeah, would it be more likely? Um, possibly. I mean, it, you know, the bottom line for MLB is if they thought they could make money off it, they'd do it. And if they didn't think they could make money off it, they wouldn't do it. Um, um, unfortunately, again, I think that misses the boat in terms of what women can bring to the game. Um, um, I, I grew up, I grew up uh, near Stratford, Connecticut, where the Ray Bestus Breakettes played. And they, they were one of the most famous uh, softball uh, teams of their time. And I was fortunate enough to, to have been taken as a boy to many of those games. And yes, I know it was softball, but it was tremendously exciting. The, the women, there were a number of tremendously accomplished women playing that game. I'd pay to see them. I'd, I'd, play to, I'd pay to see a good game. And, and yes, I want to be an ally and I want to support women, but I'm a fan. I want to see a good game. I think women can make the game even better than it is now. So I, I would, would there... I, I would watch a WMLB, um, but I think I would support, I, I, I would lend more support to having women play Major League Baseball. 
And there is a plug for to show your video at the winter meetings. <laughs> I also saw somebody wants me to run for commissioner. I am available. I'm, I'm willing to talk. <laughs> <Won't be any laughs> willing talk. to have that conversation. Apparently, it doesn't seem to be that hard of a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for a wonderful presentation, Michael. Um, thank you. 3.15, um, we will move on to our next presentation, which I believe is, yeah, Kathy Headley and Joanna Mladic. Uh, Kathy? They will be presenting on breaking barriers at Rockford University, looking back to look here, forward. Here, can you see it? Let's see. Uh, I can see it. Um, Is it, there you go. Yeah, I can see it. I just need to, you need to maximize it. Need to maximize it? Well, I mean, just to, you know, to get oh, the, yeah, yeah. To the PowerPoint Kathy. background. What's that, Joanna? Uh, to present. Yeah. Oh, technology. I can also share it too if. Right here? There you go. Okay. Excellent. All right, I'm gonna turn it on to you guys. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. Welcome to Rockford University. First off, welcome. <laughs> we are so grateful that you're here and we can't wait to see you in person. Um, again, it's kind of a long distance love relationship we have with you. We wanna just share our story with you. Um, so I'll, you, I'll share, uh, keep going, Joanna, and you can go ahead. Okay, awesome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Joanna Maladic, and I am the Electronic Resources Librarian and Archivist at Rockford University's Howard Coleman Library. I'm sorry my video isn't working today, um, but I'm really happy to be here with all of you. It's not showing up. So Joanna, will you share your screen, please? Yes. It's not working for me. Just one moment. OK. And is everyone? Yes, we see it. Let's we'll see it. OK, perfect. Yep. All righty. So for today's agenda, um, we'll talk a little bit about the history of Rockford University, um, and then we'll have a chance to talk more about the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and the Rockford Peaches, and then leave some time for discussion and questions at the end. So Rockford University was chartered in 1847 as Rockford Female Seminary. We were an all-female school until 1957 when we became co-educational. In 1892, our name changed to Rockford College, as many of you may know it, um, and then we became Rockford University in 2013. On the slide is a drawing of the original three buildings housed on old campus, and left to right at the top of the screen, they are Talcott, Middle, and Linden Halls. And these buildings um, were housed on what we call old campus, um, and today you can still drive by and see the location. Um, but the only building that's still standing is the Jewett Laboratories that were completed in the late 1940s. The Winnebago County Health Department is housed there currently. Anna Peck Sill was our first principal of Rockford Female Seminary, and her portrait is pictured on the lower left of the slide. And if you're interested, this portrait does reside on campus, um, and it's located in our Burpee Student Center, the Forest Cool Lounge near the president's office. Before she was appointed principal, she had to prove to the Board of Trustees she was capable of being principal and running the school. And to accomplish this, she began teaching students in the old courthouse um, in 1849. And within a year, the Board of Trustees decided to appoint her principal and the first class graduated in 1854. She remained principal until 1884 and she passed away on campus in 1889. Um, and remained always a part of the campus atmosphere, even when she was no longer head of the institution. And she's buried in the Greenwood Cemetery off Auburn and North 2nd Streets. 
Syl believed in the importance of training both the mind and the body. She encouraged students to exercise. And the first gymnasium was built on old campus in the 1890s as a memorial to her. There was a um, state-of-the-art equipment and students wore wool uniforms as part of their um, exercise and being a participant in those in those classes. And by encouraging students to engage in an educational experience that focused on wellness, still worked to break down the barriers that continue to exist, even though women's education was growing throughout the 1800s. And even though students and graduates um, were very talented, there were still plenty of naysayers who attempted to thwart Sill's efforts um, to educate the mind and the body. And one example is Dr. Edward Clark, who published uh, Sex and Education, A Fair Chance for Girls in 1873. He thought that women could not withstand the strenuous nature of collegiate education and that it could lead um, to overtaxing their brains. But this didn't stop her. She continued to break barriers she encouraged young women to continue their education and even helped those who couldn't afford to continue at Rockford um, by contributing part of her salary to their tuition and room board. And she continued to encourage exercise and strengthening their bodies as well as their minds. Another female president of Rockford University who also broke many barriers was President Mary Ashby Cheek. She became president in 1937 and retired in 1954. She was a graduate of Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. And when she assumed the presidency, the college was working to survive through the Great Depression of the 1930s. And in the midst of the Great Depression, she was able to have the first standalone library, the John Hall Sherratt Library built on old campus. And until this point, the library was housed on the third floor of Middle Hall and had no room to expand for a growing student population. During World War II, she helped to start the work study program on campus and students work in local industry at Woodward Governor and others to support the war efforts and their educations. During World War II, she also worked to establish the nursing program at Rockford College and partner with the Illinois Institute of Technology to establish an engineering two plus two program. After many years of work, um, since she first came to Rockford in 1937, she helped to establish our Phi Beta Kappa, Kappa chapter at Rockford University in 1954. Master's programs were established for the first time under Cheek, along with night classes for members of the Rockford community to attend college courses and or finish their degree. She also worked to establish programs for students to best be able to serve their communities, um, including speech pathology. And during her tenure, she broke quite a few barriers and always encouraged her faculty, staff, and students to do the same. For Cheek, it was creating a world where everyone had opportunities to achieve their goals and could serve the world and their communities through a liberal arts education and as lifelong learners. For geographical... Sorry, I, Kathy, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, Mary Ashby Cheek, one of the things that I think was is, is so encouraging and it's what we do. And I think it's what uh, Rockford University does well and does about, it does the great, is that um, they encur she encouraged faculty members to work with the community wherever possible. And we know that that's very much embedded in a lot of what we do here at the university. Um, and she believed the Women's College inspired young women to leadership and gave them a sense of independence and of confidence in themselves. Most definitely. For geographical reference, the map on the slide shows the location of Byer Stadium in the yellow circle at the bottom and old campus in the purple circle near the top of the screen. We just wanted to show that they were very close to one another um, and that we thought that was a very interesting connection. Very close, it seems like a mile away. Yes. <laughs> and uh, through this journey, through the journey that we're looking at, we're really trying to look at the history of, of athletics and wellness at Rockford. And we're hoping that part of what we're doing here through this little story is to unearth the relationship between Rockford Female Seminary, Rockford College, the um, All-American Girls Baseball League, the Rockford Peaches. And we feel that this location is really key. So. 
And then with the passage of Title IX in 1972, women's sports became an official part of the college's intercollegiate athletics. We had been, there'd been a lot of sports for a long time, um, but now they could officially participate in intercollegiate sports. Um, and pictured on the slide is a women's base basketball team from the 1970s, along with volleyball and tennis teams um, added as options for intercollegiate athletics. And pass it off to you, Kathy. Yep. So, and we see again this 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 breaking of barriers. We see it. We saw it in Anna Paxel, Paxil, and her as being the first principal of the the college. But what she brought was about it was uh, the history or the wellness and recreation and the importance and value of it. In the All American Girls Baseball League, as we know, it gave over six hundred women the athletics and the opportunity to play professional baseball. We know it started as um, softball, uh, but we got to play. Um, and we know the league operated from 1943 to 1954 and it took vision and it took courage. Um, and then um, we saw that during that time that Ken Sells headed the committee to problem solve, which I thought was kind of interesting that he problem solved and the um, concerns of what was going on at the war, the loss of the men, and how could we fill the stadium, which is what PK Wrigley was really looking at, is how do we fill the stadium? How do we get people there? And um, the committee com recommended girls softball was established, which then later on was the um, midway through the first season, it changed it to the girls baseball league to be distinctive to softball. Um, early in 1944, Wrigley decided he lost interest in the girls league, so he sold it to Arthur Meyerhoff, and, who expanded it and created the league and it reached his peak when it came to attendance and breaking barriers. And we wanna thank him for breaking barriers. So now I'd like to go to the Rockford Peaches, which um, you can change it, Joanna. Um, when you look at the Rockford Peaches is our baby. And I have a, uh, a little, uh, something I wanted to read before I talked about this, but it's called Loving the Peaches. Once upon a magical time, this all-girl baseball team captured the city's heart uh, is by Peggy Dahlberg Jensen. A mild June evening, 8, 1951, the Rockford Peaches led off batter or lead off batter, 28-year-old Dottie Ferguson Key crouches with a bat in hand at home plate. Her unique crabbed posture always presents a challenge for the pitcher, either get hit or get a hit. The coach William Baird Allington commanded as she left the dugout, his words ring in Key's ears. Positioned with her left arm raised, the five foot four inch center fielder hears the distant sounds of vendors, peanuts, hot dogs, programs, and she feels the surge of the crowd, the expectation of fans. They know what she knows. Key is not a great slugger, but she can work the pitcher. She'll probably advance to first base on balls or being hit by a pitch ball. He chalks up strike one and two balls. Then the inevitable happens. The ball smacks her left thigh. She limps to first base, pigtail, pigtails flopping against her peach colored flare skirted uniform. She raised her hands to the roaring crowd. Rockford adores their peaches. <laughs> and I, 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 I start that off because I just, we love the peaches. Um, when you come to Rockford, that's the picture you see, Rockford peaches are the cradle of baseball. And what a great story to just think of, to, to just consider. So the league itself we know began as a nonprofit organization um, and they had four teams, the Rockford peaches are one of the original four teams in the league. And for the most, Wrigley modified the rules for the women who for the most part came from fast pitch. Um, they had to, we've got archived at the uh, Midway Village has a lot of archived pictures and posters and presentations and uniforms and of the Rockford Peaches and it's just wonderful. It's, the Peaches are one of the most successful teams in the AAGBL. They won the league championship in 1945, 1948, 1949 and 1950. Um, <clears throat> they were one of the two teams that played with other teams, or I'm sorry, skip that. Um, one of the other areas that I thought was really interesting that the Peaches did is that they tried to find ways. How did Rockford love its Peaches? Rockford loved its Peaches because they saw these events were innocent 
going to baseball games innocent as compared to the rash of drug abuse and gambling charges against professional ball players that we see. Um, the public bemoans character flaws and celebrities, but they applaud and admire achievements. So they loved our Rockford peaches. In 1950, the Rockford vehicle sticker, stickers depicted a peach at bat. Uh, organizations and businesses, the Rotary, the Lions, the Kiwanis, the Fraternal Order of Eagles, Sunstrand Corporation, they honored the peach personnel at luncheons, at dinners. Prominent citizens were volunteers on their board. Um, chaperones hardly had a time, had to find places for the peaches to live. So, and one story is that um, Waddell struck a bargain with a, her landlady and she said, I hated to iron and she disliked dishwashing. So what else says, she did my laundry and I did the dishes. So it was a very familial loving relationship. Um, some of the, the locals owned restaurants, had the peaches over. Um, one of the, the locals decorated the tables in peaches uniforms. The friendship resulted in um, Connie, who was one of the peaches serving as a back girl for four seasons. And now she's a school bus driver, or she was at this time in 1999. Um, so there are peaches that became prominent in the community and they stayed here and lived and died here. So it, I, Rockford loves our peaches. We find through this journey that um, so far that Rockford loves the peaches, the peaches loved Rockford and um, the people that embraced them still keep some of their memorabilia um, and, and still keep American Girls or AAGBL uh, memorabilia. In fact, we have one man, gentleman that contacted us about two weeks ago that said he had um, a player's uniform and cap and a scorebook, but she was a like an accessory player for the Peaches and she went on to play with the, for uh, I think a, um, a local, smaller league in Loves Park. So I thought that was kind of interesting. If you can go to the next one. The next um, picture is one that I just thought was interesting is these are from the Midway Village. These are the stockholders. These are people that said, you know, from 1943 to 1950 plus, they believed in the Rockford Peaches. And if you look at them, I was, I was trying to, quickly, but I didn't do it well enough. I was trying to quickly look through and see Rockford is known as the screw capital of the world because Rockford industry was screws. So there's many screw companies here and we still are the screw, screw city is what they call us. Um, and so what our hope it to do is to continue to look at the, the connection between some of these stockholders, some of our current businesses um, and see, are they still here? Are they still like the, the, so we have so the Kiwanis, the Rotary Club, the Rockford Eagles, are these people still desiring to be partners with us? Cause they were the original stockholders. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So when we look at this um, in 1943, there were 46,882 fans attended the home games. Interest grew in 1994 or 1944 with 80,000 from 46,000 to 80,000 within a year um, and July up until up to a Monday night, July 16th, 1945, 53,969 people passed through the gates, witnessing 25 home games in 25 nights. That's an average of 21.58 per, per night. So um, the Rockford Club leads the league in attendance. Um, they were league in the lead at that time in number of games won and it's everyone's wish they bring home the pennant. So now what we thought we would do is, you can go to the end, we thought that we'd like to just kind of talk, just ask questions and bring discussions about, you know, the city of Rockford loves its peaches. And I think um, those of you that know about the International Women's Baseball Center, we're hoping to bring the home here and realizing that there is a theme and there is um, the sprinkling of Title IX and the willingness of women as we've seen in these previous um, discussions and presentations, just the history. There's such a strength and there's always a strength when there's more than two strands. When there's three strands, it's a tight 
knit. And I think there is something with the relationship between Rockford, the city of Rockford, the Rockford University, the Rockford Peaches, and the um, All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. So Joanna, do you want to share more? I think just to add on to that, um, really that, that Rockford was breaking barriers and that the Rockford Peaches were doing the same and that we're very interested in seeing what the connection is there. We couldn't actually find any of our students or graduates who were participating um, in the Rockford Peaches, um, but we're hoping that, that there is some connection there and that, that we can find out what that is and, and discover more about it. We're actually taking the, um, the whole list, like the All-American Girls Baseball list, not to, or, uh, besides the peaches. I'm only on M's in the peaches going through the archive. So <laughs> it's quite <laughs> um, a list. <laughs> I know it's a really long list. And so and then, of course, I have I'm here with students. So I have students that will be available to help do some research. Because <laughs> when I looked at the um, AAGBL, GPBL list, there's plenty more to go through. Um, and yes, as we look are. at the Rockford archives and that. So, but up through M, no. <laughs> <laughs> and what a great idea, Leslie. I think, uh, um, I guess we haven't spoken about that. Maybe Senior Sum should be doing that. Do you see the question? Yes, we could have, have some research assistance. Yeah. And women's baseball at the university. I think that's a cool idea. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> it is a great idea, Leslie. Thank you. <laughs> Other thoughts? Other. <laughs> Mary, are you asking a question? Uh, there? Well, I, I have a thought. It, uh, I'm not sure it takes you anywhere near the peaches, though, but you might be interested in looking at the influence that Rockford Female Seminary and Rockford College had on Jane Adams and Hull House, because mm -hmm. Hull, Hull House really emphasized the importance of sport. Um, Jane Adams was instrumental in the beginning of the the playground movement as well. Um, I don't know the full history of women playing basketball at her whole house, but I think it was one of the first places where that sport was played in the city of Chicago by women. So there might be something there to look at in connection with what happened in Chicago and Hull House after um, Adams took, uh, she was very much influenced by her education at Rockford Female Seminary and Rockford College, um, and that impacted the broad spectrum of um, what was happening at Hull House, too, and including um, recreation and sport. So something. And, and again, I think there's so much, it's more than, it's more than Rockford baseball, and we, and we understand that. I think it, it is, it's more of uh, it's a larger conversation of women and women and wellness and health and yeah. recreation activity, which is it there. It's it, like I said, it's a, it's, it's all three intertwined together to be strengthened. And it's been a, a theme throughout our history. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and she is, she was still active in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. So. Well, she died in 35, so. Oh, she died later, sorry. No, um, I, I don't know of a connection with the peaches, but there, there might be something at work there. I'm not sure. Okay, we can look. Thank you, Mary. Hope that helps. It's like uh, Cecilia's got a question. Um, you know, it's interesting. It seems almost like it wasn't a coincidence that, um, you know, the Rockford peaches happened, you know, because the university was so progressive. And Cecilia wanted to know if it was known that that was, you know, the progressive nation of the, of the university was part of the reason why the team was situated there. Like if, if we knew for sure. And I don't, uh, I don't think I don't. I, yeah. It was money. 
Did you say, oh, <laughs> Kat said there was money. <laughs> Always about money. That's a great question, though. Yeah. But yes. <laughs> Do we know if there was a recruiting effort on campus to get peaches at all? That's what we can't find. So far, we've looked in. I've looked in the um, in our archives. You can go through the. There's faculty. There's uh, board of trustees. But I've only looked through the digital yearbooks. So um, that's a. So, gotcha. but we're we want to look specifically for those years from like 19, well, actually like 1935 when Mary, Cheek, Mary Ashby Cheek was here as the president and see what the board of trustees, because there that's why I feel there might be somewhere near it, yeah. And yeah, I don't know if you see this, but Byer Stadium is located on Seminary, which is the same street, by, um, mm -hmm. through street as Rockford Female Seminary. Lorraine cites uh, Chicago Collections is a good ref a good resource to search a bunch of libraries. Um, yeah, otherwise, there are too many questions. Okay. But are there others? Well, thank you very much. Any thoughts and any any direction we can go on this? We would take. What is the status of the the? Women's Baseball Center right now. I know last I heard the city council was going back and forth about it. Do you want to jump in? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to take that. Oh. Um, we are. I'm sorry. We've got major feedback. Um, Um, the the IWBC is um, it's it's uh, moving forward is the best way to describe it. We have um, some uh, really fabulous things in the works. We hope that by the mid of, uh, mid October, all of the uh, planning, zoning, all of that stuff will be done, and we will embark on November first on our capital campaign. Uh, called a place of their own. So be on the lookout. It's happening. Good to hear. Anything else? Yeah. All right. So thank you, thank right. you, Tara, for being our wonderful moderator this afternoon through all of these great presentations. Thank you to all of the wonderful present presenters and for everything that has been shared today. We've learned a lot and uh, looks like we're all gonna be looking forward to many, many books and, and future presentations as all of this goes forward. Um, just a reminder to everybody that we are now taking a break and we will be back at 5.30 Eastern Standard Time, which means 4.30 for others for the unveiling of our pylon for the IWBC and the announcement of the 2021 winner of the Dorothy Seymour Mills Lifetime Achievement Award, followed by our keynote speaker, Dana Bookman. So we hope that you will return for all of that. So we're gonna take a break now, but we'll see you all at 5.30. Thanks everybody. It's a great afternoon.